So luckily, a lot of uh, my heavy work has been done by the previous speakers, so I can uh, skip through a couple of my slides a little bit more easily. Um, I think Jonathan set a very good tone for this talk. Um, although we've made leaps and strides in diseases like CLL, it's been more of a, an uphill battle with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, but I will talk uh, about some of these strategies on the horizon for this disease particularly, and uh, a lot of those strategies build on um, some of the challenges that we've heard in earlier talks. So uh, rather than just list off a litany of, of uh, new agents presented at ASCO and ASH, I wanted to organize the talk um, around the themes that, that you have been hearing, some of the more uh, challenging themes that we deal with in DLBCL, such as how do we customize treatment by cell of origin, uh, how can we tackle this tremendous problem of double hit or double expressor, DLBCL, and what other salvage therapies have developed just by serendipity. So starting with uh, the cell of origin, which you've already heard a lot about today, um, the uh, original Stout paper in, or Stout group paper in 2002 showed us by an unsupervised analysis that there were uh, patients who fell kind of in two buckets, either the germinal center-like or the non-germinal center-like, which was further divided into an unclassifiable type and an activated B cell type. And uh, these uh, profiles mirrored what was seen in natural physiology. So uh, the germinal center B cell uh, looked like a, uh, an expression pattern that's seen in the germinal center, uh, and the activated B cell type looked like an expression pattern that was uh, recapitulated in, in uh, physiologic terms in uh, B cells that had seen an antigen and were active against that antigen. Um, not to really bewilder you with another uh, uh, diagram of different signal transduction pathways, but I wanna just flash this up to illustrate one of the differences that we've noticed between those two cells of origin. And that's that although the B cell receptor is central to both pathways, the way it's activated and the downstream signaling seems to be different in the two different cells of origin. So in the activated B cell subtype, there seems to be um, what uh, many have called the chronic active B cell receptor signaling. And this seems to rely more on the NF-kappa B pathway. Whereas in the GCB subtype, uh, there's something called a tonic BCR signaling pathway uh, that seems to, although it, it goes through the B cell receptor, does seem to use a different pathway and, and, and more preferentially uses the PI3 kinase pathway. So in targeting these two different pathways, one of the strategies that's been used is to use NF-kappa B inhibitors against the, um, the non-GCB subtypes. And uh, that's where ibrutinib comes on the scene. This is a very early um, slide of ibrutinib, and it shows the, corval the covalent bond that it forms in the binding pack, uh, pocket of brutin tyrosine kinase. We used to think it had a higher specificity for brutin tyrosine kinase than we've since learned. And there are other kinases, tyrosine kinases, that are inhibited that may actually have just as much to do with ibrutinib's activity as BTK blockade. Um, but it does um, significantly block the NF-kappa B pathway, at least in in vitro models. And uh, when, when uh, we and the NIH led the trial, the phase two trial of ibrutinib and DLBCL, it wasn't a very exciting response rate that we saw overall, but when you looked at the subtypes of patients in the trial, you can see here that almost all of the responses were seen in patients with the ABC subtype here represented in blue bars, and most of the non-responders uh, clustered with patients in the GCB subtype, and this was all done by, um, by uh, genetic profiling, not by the Hans algorithm. And when you look at it that way in the bar graph, there was a 40% response rate in the ABC subtype uh, as opposed to the GCB subtype. Now, I, I definitely agree with Jonathan that the uh, cell of origin is kind of a dirty way to classify DLBCL, and we can possibly, we can probably do a lot better uh, using specific genetic profiling or uh, specific genomic, genomic studies. 
Uh, this slide uh, is a swimmer's pot just indicating that the patients who did have the ABC, DLBCL, and had responses were able to remain on drug a lot longer. And uh, I have an ongoing patient who's been on this trial since 2012. We actually had to open an expansive trial just so he can still get the drug. And he's going on four years of treatment um, with ABC, multiply refractory, DLBCL, still in complete remission. And uh, what's, what's more is this drug is very well tolerated. Now, of course, uh, as a drug becomes more popular and more widespread in use, we realize more side effects from these drugs. And there are side effects like uh, atrial fibrillation and platelet inactivation that can become problematic over time. But in general, this drug is pretty well tolerated. And most of the patients uh, can uh, tolerate long periods of time on the drug, which is needed because as Jonathan also mentioned earlier, some of these uh, specific targeted drugs need to be given indefinitely or the response is not durable. Uh, targeting the other end, the uh, GCB subtype is actually, I think, becoming more of an unmet need now than the ABC subtype because in those patients who aren't cured the first time around, um, these patients can be even more refractory with not a lot of uh, promising targeted drugs on the horizon. In fact, um, as I said, the PI3 kinase pathway, which is thought to be very important in these uh, patients, has not been successfully targeted um, with targeted PI3 kinase inhibitors, either the TG therapeutics compound, buparlicib, copanlicib. Um, pick your PI3 kinase inhibitor. Most of the response rates have been less than 20%. One of the more promising drugs in this uh, area that I was able to find trudging through abstracts was one that we published, uh, the CUDC907, which is actually a joint uh, HDAC inhibitor and PI3 kinase inhibitor. And here you can see that the majority of patients with uh, DLBCL uh, had enjoyed some sort of response with this, but of course, this is a dual action drug, so it's hard to tease out the PI3 kinase activity. So moving on to the double hit, double expressor DLBCLs, I don't know if Ariel is here to give, okay, so she's not giving her part of the talk. Uh, so I didn't delve into this too much, um, but Jonathan touched on it in his talk, and I'll talk about targeting it specifically. We we may have ways, we do have a way to target one of the partners in many of these double expressors, BCL2, and there may be ways, getting to Dr. Bertino's question, to co-target MYC as well. Um, the BCL2 inhibitors, uh, just to remind you of what the BCL2 pathway does, I think most people here are, are pretty familiar with this um, family of proteins, but uh, basically uh, it's, it's driven by BAX and BAC, um, which can either form homo or heterodimers and produce pores in mitochondria that short circuit the uh, generator of, the, of, of uh, energy for the cell. Uh, if you can keep Bax and Bac from hetero or homodimerizing using um, anti-apoptotic proteins like BCL2, one of the first to be discovered, um, you can keep those two proteins apart and therefore you disrupt the apoptotic, the normal apoptotic signaling and overexpression of BCL2 and some other anti-apoptotic family members has been shown to be very important in the pathophysiology of multiple lymphomas. The first generation BCL2 inhibitor um, that we were fortunate enough to participate in a trial of was ABT263. Uh, and unfortunately, it not only inhibited the uh, anti-apoptotic protein BCL2, but also BCLXL. And as we learned from that trial, BCXL, BCLXL is crucial in platelet survival. Um, so this drug was limited in development by a profound thrombocytopenia that made it very difficult to bring forward either as a single agent or to combine with other therapies. Um, at the people at AbbVie overcame that by developing a second generation molecule, ABT199, now you all know as venetoclax, which targets BCL2 but not BCLXL, so you don't get this thrombocytopenia, and uh, you're all familiar with the New England Journal article in CLL and the approval for deletion 17P CLL, where this has been uh, remarkably uh, active. Um, 
as the, that was, um, that's data that was predicated by the phase one trial that we participated in. Um, our center actually enrolled more patients on that trial than any other center. And arm B of that trial was non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which uh, uh, Matt, David, and I have just submitted uh, to the JCO for review. So some of that data is embargoed, but I can share with you what I presented at ASH last year. Uh, you'll be familiar, those of you who use venetoclax with the, with the uh, typical dose escalation schedule, intrapatient dose escalation schedule that's needed to avoid tumor lysis syndrome in these patients, which is fortunately a reflection of the activity of the drug. Um, the, uh, this drug actually is, is a very nice drug in terms of side effect profile. So we have patients who have been on this drug for two and three years and continue to tolerate the drug very well. Um, some of the side effects, some of the more prominent side effects that patients experience are fatigue and uh, GI symptoms like diarrhea, but these tend to be uh, manageable over time with uh, with supportive medications, and uh, there is no uh, real appreciable thrombocytopenia, at least that is limiting in most patients. There is some neutropenia, but the good news is you can just treat with growth factors without interruption of study drug or without interruption of venetoclax, and the neutropenia resolves. We had quite promising results similar to those seen in CLL with mantle cell lymphoma. Interestingly, follicular lymphoma, where we would have thought we might get our biggest bang for our buck given that 90% of follicular lymphoma patients overexpress BCL2 due to the T1418 translocation, we didn't get that much response. And we didn't get a hugely promising response in DLBCL, only 18% response rate, which, as you can see from these swimmer's plots, is not very durable. Um, so as a single agent, there's not a lot of promise for ABT199 or venetoclax. However, we're hoping that since this drug is so well tolerated with a non-overlapping toxicity profile with many other drugs, that its true potential is going to be in combinations with other drugs. And uh, in ASH 2015, uh, Dr. DeVos and colleagues also presented data on a venetoclax uh, bendamustine rituximab trial, which showed a, a pretty promising 46% response rate in DLBCL with a CR rate in two out of 13 patients. Targeting the other end of these uh, double hit lymphomas is MYC inhibition. Now, un unfortunately, MYC is not a protein that we've ever figured out how to directly target. It doesn't have a neat little binding pocket that you can fit a small molecule in and stop it from doing what it does. So we've had to target uh, MYC to date in indirect manners. Uh, and one of those is through bromodomain inhibitors or BET inhibitors. Uh, now, we published, or, or Dr. Yunus actually presented uh, at ASH a uh, trial with uh, CPI, a, a BET inhibitor that didn't look uh, tremendously active as a single agent. And I'm afraid I don't have a, a lot more hope in single agent BET inhibitors based on one of the more promising trials that was presented um, with an on oncoethics drug called OTX015, which was just recently published in Lancet Hematology. But it did show, this drug does show clear activity in DLBCL, just not a huge amount by itself. So um, we agree very much with Dr. Bertino that we would love to see um, ABT or a similar uh, BCL2 inhibitor combined with a MYC inhibitor to see if we can make inroads in these diseases, especially these double hit DLBCLs, and that is one of the uh, legs of a SPORE grant that we've uh, that we've submitted that we're going to try to capitalize on. And in the meantime, uh, Dr. Yunus also has in trial the Novartis uh, new BCL2 inhibitor uh, in combination therapy. And then finally, um, salvage therapy. So a lot of our discoveries or, or movement in these fields often comes from serendipity, and there are a couple of uh, things that we've learned that we may not have expected. Um, here's one of the drugs that you've heard a bunch about this morning, the EZH2 inhibitor, and this is what I like to call a non-targeted targeted therapy. So um, we know a target for this drug. It inhibits, uh, uh, there, there are EGH, uh, EZH2 inhibitors that specifically inhibit EZH2, which is a catalytic subunit of uh, polychrome repressor complex and leads to disruption of uh, methylation. 
causing an expression of a number of genes that were formerly silenced. The reason I call it a non-targeted targeted therapy is it has a clear target, EZH2, but that target does a bunch of things like the proteasome or like uh, histone deacetylases. So although we can inhibit these, it may be decades before we figure out why they work. Um, but this drug clearly does work. And uh, when you looked in the uh, phase one trial uh, that was reported by Rybrag et al. at ASH in 2015, there was a 50% response rate in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So this is one of the most promising drugs in DLBCL that we've seen in a while. And although we've looked to see if this drug um, has specificity for EZH mutations, we found that it actually doesn't, and uh, that uh, goes back to one of the things that uh, Omar mentioned earlier, in that um, there are other ways to activate this trimethylation complex, like the SWE SNF pathway, and uh, there are other mutations that might cause activity in this pathway that can still be targeted or make cells di uh, um, addicted to having EZH2 activity without involving direct EZH mutations. Um, still in all, we are doing a phase two trial that treats patients in baskets. Uh, DLBCL and folliculolymphoma, both arms with and without EZH mutations that we're gonna be uh, looking at, and, and uh, we are the national lead of that trial. We're hoping, based on our genomic profiling platform, to be able to move forward with the arms that have been most hard to accrue in that trial, which are the EZH mutation arms. Uh, this is also a drug that's very well tolerated. We've treated our first two patients on this trial to date, and uh, I just saw one of the patients uh, granted early, cycle one, day 15, but literally has no side effects whatsoever. Um, the main limiting side effect of this drug is the thrombocytopenia. Um, and I should also mention uh, that uh, the, the drug was shown in a preclinical model um, to possibly lead to a T-cell lymphoma in, one, in a rat. Um, so the FDA has prohibited us from opening the follicular lymphoma arms of this trial, but uh, we will hopefully be opening that soon once safety is demonstrated in Europe. Uh, and then actually, I, I won't talk about this because Craig uh, already was able to mention um, what Craig Moskowitz had presented uh, at ASH two years ago, but one other promising uh, new drug uh, in, the, in the class of drugs that, um, that Jonathan alluded to earlier, the antibody drug conjugates, is polituzumab vidotin. So similar to um, uh, brentuximab vidotin, this is the MMAE uh, uh, warhead that is attached to an antibody that recognizes CD79B. And uh, the waterfall plot for, for this drug looks quite promising, an overall response rate of 56% in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And Matt Matazar is running a trial combining polituzumab with uh, bendamustine and either rituximab or bonituzumab. And I'll stop there so we can hopefully catch up a little bit. Thanks.